Uh, welcome everybody, my name is Stanley Bill, I'm Professor of Polish Studies here at the University of Cambridge and it's a great pleasure to welcome you to this event on the subject of the geopolitics of memory in contemporary German-Polish relations. The event is organized by the Baltic Geopolitics Program under the auspices of the Center for Geopolitics as you can see behind us and we're going to be concentrating on one of the most important relationships in Europe, I think we might say, between the largest country in Europe by population and the fifth largest in the European Union, between the largest economy and the sixth largest economy. Uh, countries that have extremely important relationship with each other bilaterally. If we simply look at economy from Poland's point of view, Germany is the number one trading partner. It's number one in exports and imports. It's over a quarter of Poland's exports go to Germany. But for Germany too, we're looking at positions fifth and fourth when it comes to exports and imports uh, with Poland. German exports to Poland are only slightly below the level of exports to China. So it's an extremely important relationship. It's a relationship that also has a deep and often troubled shared history. And this history has burst onto the political scene particularly over the last eight years and particularly under the law and justice government, which of course has recently lost power in Poland, that has put this at the center of its approach to foreign policy, but also to a kind of domestic politics of dignity, national pride, and a new self-assertiveness in its relations with the outside world and particularly uh, in Europe. So the question of memory and of history is a question that's interesting and important in itself, but it's a question that also weighs on this very significant political and geopolitical relationship at the heart of Europe. So that's the question that we'll be discussing today, and we have four distinguished guests uh, from, who have joined us from Poland and Germany uh, to discuss these questions. And I'll introduce them in the order in which they will appear in our conversation. So we will have our speakers give some introductory remarks of between five and ten minutes, and then we will throw the conversation uh, open uh, to the room for a much wider uh, discussion. So to begin, we will have Karolina Vigura, who is sitting at the end, and she is an associate professor at the Institute of Sociology at the University of Warsaw, also one of the founders of the influential Cultura Liberalna in Warsaw, and a senior fellow of the Center for Liberal Modernity in Berlin. Uh, we have uh, in the middle here Dr. Florian Peters, who is a member of the Structural Change of Property Interdisciplinary Research Center at the Institute of History at the Friedrich Schiller University, Jena. We have Pavel Makcevich next to him, who is Professor of History at the Institute of Political Studies of the Polish Academy of Sciences and formerly founding director of the Museum of the Second World War in Gdańsk. And next to me, Claudia Weber, who is Professor Chair for European Contemporary History at the European University Viadrina Frankfurt Oder. So, could you please join me in very warmly welcoming our guests to Cambridge. So I'd like to uh, invite uh, Carolina to open uh, our conversation. Yes, thank you so much, Stan, for inviting me here and for uh, giving me this chance to exchange about Polish-German relationships. I was listening to you and I thought it's perhaps not the most important question why peace concentrated so much on Germany, but the more important question is how the new government's politics seems so similar and where is it isn't similar. This is per perhaps the question that, that should be asked. And whilst reading before this presentation, I thought about a certain book and a certain title, Kinderszenen. This is a set of, first, it is a set of music pieces for piano by Schumann from the 19th century. But second, it's a title of a book which was written in Polish, although it has a German title. The book by Jarosław Marek Rymkiewicz, in which he describes his kinder scenen, so scenes from childhood. His scenes from childhood were basically horrible because this was the German occupation of Warsaw. Now, Rymkiewicz was a guru of the Polish conservative right. 
And the book published in, twen in, in, 20, uh, uh, in 2008 has been very easily and quickly incorporated into the peace ideological uh, 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 struggle against Germany. And indeed, Rimkevich was, has also become a symbol of the, this anti-German resentment of Polish national conservatives. But yet, I have been thinking about the book and I have been thinking about the, the famous sentence from it. Rimkevich writes, we have forgotten the Germans too quickly and too easily. And this sentence seems extremely re relevant when it comes to what is happening today to Poland and to Polish-German relations. So to explain this, I would just like to point at three main misunderstandings that are present in the, in the, in the discussion about Polish-German relationships of today. The first misunderstanding concerns what it actually means that Poland and Germany had a reconciliation process. We had, after 1945, an extremely successful reconciliation process. It started as early as 1965 with the letter of Polish bishops to the German bishops, then an answer. Then we have many, 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 many steps on a very successful road. So if this, is, this road is so successful, what happened? that we have this change now in politics. What happens to history and to what is being said about history? Well, the answer number one is that the reconciliation itself is something completely different now, or it should mean something completely different. What I mean, when the Polish bishops and German bishops have been writing the letters, when Kohl and Mazowiecki met, when Willy Brandt came to war, so et cetera, et cetera, we had a, an epoch where reconciliation could be coined by elites, when educators were more important than influencers, and when we didn't have social media. And last but not least, the relations between Poland and Germany were bilateral, whilst today the relations are multilateral. We are in common Europe, and we do have war in Ukraine, and this changes everything. So we actually should praise the success of Polish-German reconciliation, but we should remember that the epoch is new and we have new challenges. Now, the second misunderstanding is about what happened to those relations in the past eight years so that they, they have deteriorated. And that those relations have not only deteriorated because we had populist government at power, and neither will the new democratic government in Warsaw be quick to come back to the past, to the status quo ante. Why? Well, Polish-German history is basically 200 years, at least, of difficult relationships with Gem German empire, imperialism coming back again and again. These 2000 year, two, 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 200 years, um, are a very good residuum of fears and resentments, and they are very easy to be awakened. They can be awakened by international circumstances or by political manipulation. In February 2020, uh, 2022, when the full-scale war in Ukraine started, we had both factors. We had a changing international circumstances and at the same time a political manipulation because we had Law and Justice Party manipulating and using the anti-German propaganda. But it was not the only thing going on because in 2024, when Mr. Sikorsky goes to Berlin, he basically talks about reparations. So something is extremely telling here. What is happening? Well, for the past eight years, many Western observers have been understanding what is happening in Polish politics through the lens of peace. So one would say, oh, this is happening because the populists are at power. This is only because the populists are in power. Everything is caused by peace. But in fact, deeper processes took place during those years, almost a decade. And they have been catalyzed by February 2022. And this is extremely important. Now, just to give you an example of this. In 2022, Jarosław Kaczyński comes back to his favorite idea that we should claim the reparations from Germany. What does the civic platform answer 
What does the opposition answer? They do not ridicule that, not at least. They say, with the, with the, this is a quote from Boris Budka, one of the most important persons in the civic platforms of democratic opposition in Poland at the time. He says, if one wants to talk seriously about reparations, one should uh, demand, demand reparations from those countries who caused World War II, Nazi Germany and Soviet Russia. And then he continues saying, basically suggesting, if you vote for a civic platform, we will be more effective in, in leading to those reparations. So what is happening? What has happened? What is the breakthrough? This is the third misunderstanding. And this is not about Poland, or this is not only about Poland. So when you listen to what the politicians are saying in Warsaw, it is stunning how similar this rhetoric is to what is being said in Tallinn, to what is being said in Vilnius, in Kiev, in, in, uh, uh, and, and you can actually draw a line from the north, Finland, up to Moldova. What is this line? When you see it on the map, you basically cannot see it anymore. This is the Ribbentrop-Molotov Pact line. This is the traumatic line of experience of the countries that happen to be in East Central Europe. Now, Jarosław Kuiś and me have written about this in two books, A New Politics of Poland. This is in, 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 in English, Post-Traumatische Souveränität. This is in German. And our most important argument is that there is a new constellation in East Central Europe which has been experiencing Russian imperialism and German imperialism and also the fact that the West has been looking away for many, many years, which has caused a certain trauma of losing statehood. Now, this trauma is a certain knowledge. I can come back to it later. This trauma also uh, is nothing new, but it has been catalyzed by the, by the full-scale war in Ukraine. And that's how uh, Andrzej Duda, who is a person from the Peace Party, and Kaya Kalas, who is a liberal democrat, were speaking in the same voice from the beginning of the war. This is the voice of the post-traumatic sovereignty. What does it mean for Germany? It basically means that the moral role of Germany is being uh, criticized, is being uh, seen in a completely different line, uh, uh, light by those countries. And it changes basically everything because it is as if you had a Me Too moment, an East Central European Me Too moment, when not only Poland, but also other countries say, okay, so if Nord Stream 1 and the Nord Stream 2 were wrong, and if the evaluation of the President Putin's regime was wrong in Germany, then perhaps we also have a claim to something and then come the reparations. Now, what will happen with this claim, whether this will be realized or not, whether this will be consequently demanded is another thing. But we, what we can see here is a, 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 an important and profound change of identity of East Central Europe, uh, which has treated its integration of the, with the European Union and basically politics and also foreign politics as a kind of an exam for 35 years. We had to prove that we are as good as. But now with this new sentence, we have been right. It is not a junior-senior relation anymore. And this, I think, is at the bottom of what has been happening with the German-Polish relations. Thank you. Thank you I'm very much, Karolina. It was perfect timekeeping time. as well. Thank you. Oh. Uh, I, I'd now like to uh, give the floor to Florian. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for your invitation to Cambridge and for the opportunity to share some of my reflections on, the, on this different, uh, difficult um, topic of German-Polish memory and its geopolitical um, uh, yeah, uh, problems um, related to that, that. And quite similar as uh, Carolina Vigura, I would also uh, like to um, go back to the um, yeah, most recent past, uh, actually, um, by starting with a, with a quote, my favorite quote, actually, by Jarosław Kaczynski. 
um, from summer 22, uh, Cheban Yemet complex uh, One shouldn't have complexes. Already today, there's no more Poles working on the asparagus fields, and God willing, the time will come when those from the West will come to us to work on those fields, end of quote. So this was um, one of, uh, one of uh, a phrase uh, which was quite frequently repeated in a series of speeches by Jaroslav Kaczynski in summer 22 in order to, to show and illustrate the, the economic rise of Poland and the economic success, of course, enabled or um, yeah, made easier, uh, mostly in his view, by the economic politics of the law and justice government. Um, now, uh, why do I uh, quote this here? Um, obviously, as a matter of fact statement, um, this um, is easily, um, can easily be refuted. Um, there still are Polish workers in German agriculture, although the number, their number is, rec uh, and, and also on the asparagus fields, which is of course a symbol for, for this in a, in a certain, certain way, but the number is uh, decreasing and, and Poles are um, accompanied by, by Romanians, Ukrainians, other Eastern Europeans um, uh, for the last years. Um, Nonetheless, um, I do think uh, this statement, um, uh, and also the way it is, it is phrased and presented, is a, provides a good starting point for, for rethinking some of um, the issues of memory and, and historical politics um, that have been so prominent in recent uh, German-Polish uh, relations. Obviously, we shouldn't um, overstate this rather curious call um, um, not to have complexes yeah, by Jaroslav Kaczynski, which is evidently um, belied by his desire to see those from the West, he doesn't even, even name Germans uh, at this point, uh, to do, in his view, humiliating work uh, on, on Polish uh, fields and Polish agriculture. Still, I find it telling that uh, this, uh, that. Uh, Kaczynski does not at this point, uh, at this, in this very emotional phrase, uh, does not relate to the well-established topics of German-Polish relations, um, memory conflicts, uh, focusing on, on World War II, uh, Holocaust, uh, which, which have all been so prominent in the, in the official politics of history by, by this government. So, uh, Kaczynski's statement, um, in a certain, certain extent, um, serves uh, for me as a hint not to take the moral outrage attached to these topics all too seriously. In my view, um, the mid-20th uh, century problems and uh, um, conflicts and, and heavy and, and, and really, really big German crimes um, committed in Poland um, today rather uh, provide a convenient battleground for staging show fights. Um, they neither constitute the origins of contemporary Polish-German conflicts nor the true object uh, of mutual uh, misunderstandings uh, and misperceptions we are talking about. The dark shadows that continue to compromise our shared past are not thrown, in my uh, view, for, by World War II crimes in the first place anymore, but by the memory of the Sragosam post-1989 transformation to which actually uh, Kaczynski uh, relates at this point, uh, to, the, to the experiences of Poles who worked as migrant workers in Germany, in Western Europe, and uh, well had shared different uh, and very, very various uh, experiences uh, with this work. This might uh, seem surprising to many in the first place because uh, the post-social transformation of uh, Poland is um, seen by many as a, as a pretty, pretty um, um, unquestionable success story. And it is uh, to a certain extent with regard to both um, economic and political dimensions. For example, Marcin Piankowski uh, a few years ago uh, called uh, Poland Europe's growth champion. Uh, and um, he had good, um, good, good aggregate uh, economic numbers, figures to, to, um, to substantiate this, uh, this view. But nonetheless, the picture looked different, um, I would say, for ordinary Poles um, who did not look actually at these aggregate, pictures, uh, uh, aggregate figures, uh, but witnessed, um, for example, the, co the collapse of local economic structures 
um, built uh, under state socialism, um, uh, which simply simply ceased to be uh, competitive uh, in the new uh, uh, market economy, but uh, which had provided the means their livelihood simply had relied on. So the next question would be why of all things these, these uh, post-transformation uh, um, experiences should divide Germans and Poles? Um, because one might, of course, uh, say, um, well, didn't Polish uh, solidarity, Solidarność, pave the way for the fall of the Berlin Wall? Wasn't uh, post-socialist transformation a shared experience, actually, since Eastern Germany, of course, also had to struggle with, uh, with capitalism, <laughs> to have it, have it very broadly here at this point. Um, no, my point is, it was not a shared experience. And it was, and it's still until today, it's had not, it, it, it uh, has not been transformed into a shared story um, by now. Uh, when the Berlin Wall actually came down, few East Germans felt grateful for the Poles to, to make this possible. Most of them were eager to catch up with Western, West German living standards. And West German political elites, of course, calculating the votes to be gathered in the Neue Länder, did everything in their might to make this rise of living, uh, living standards possible. They uh, enabled uh, freedom of travel to Western Europe. They enabled the express accession of Eastern Germany to the European community at that point, later European Union and NATO, not to forget about that. And of course, they, they guaranteed a huge amount of funding uh, for making the hardships of transformation more bearable in the east of Germany. And of course, these measures um, can be seen as, as successful in the sense that they rapidly reduced the borders between East Germany and Western Germany and Western Europe, more broadly speaking. But we should not forget, and I think uh, in, the, in the German perspective, we, we forget too often about the fact that these changes, this shift of Eastern Germany towards the West, also created new barriers eastwards towards Poland and uh, the Eastern neighbors. Um, Eastern uh, Germans were, well, Eastern Germans were, were actually invited to, to Western Europe. Poles were at least temporarily locked out from accessing even East Germany and Berlin. Uh, where they uh, could, without much trouble, uh, travel before. So this Polish laments over the tendency um, to, to neglect uh, Poland's pioneering role in bringing down um, Eastern European communism are indeed, uh, to a certain extent, um, um, justified, in my view, uh, since there has not been much symbolic or even material appreciation uh, for, this, uh, for this pioneering role um, in the 1990s. And uh, uh, German Chancellor Helmut Kohl even um, struck an especially um, awkward chord uh, by refusing to accept the Odenaise border um, before unification. Uh, so this was, of course, uh, in this situation where, where Poland uh, po Poles felt uh, uh, to be in the position to, to have, having, having brought about this change, this was uh, like something um, yeah, uh, quite, um, quite um, uh, insensitive, um, uh, so to speak. Um, and, in, and I think if we keep this in mind, uh, uh, the, the, the talk about Polish-German reconciliation, which, which was actually, actually on the political level, starting afterwards, directly after, after, the, after the unification, uh, when, when the Polish-German um, neighborhood treaty was, was signed and so on, and the big funds were also again uh, set into this Polish-German reconciliation uh, foundation. Um, this looked rather hollow in a situation where, where, where German in fact, Germany, in fact, had, had prioritized um, both the interests of, of Eastern Germany and its national economic interests, um, and the interest, of course, of not, not um, um, uh, allowing for any, any thinking about peace talks um, uh, and reparations actually um, um, coming up by, by uh, focusing the, the um, uh, attention on this border question. So actually also this, this reparation question can be seen in this context rather, and actually it should be seen rather in the context of the early 1990s when, when Germany um, 
deliberately um, avoided uh, to, to settle this question and not uh, accepted um, or not, not, not wasn't ready to accept the, the rather moral economy based arguments of the Polish sides, um, then uh, linked this back to the to the uh, to the um, uh, yeah, mid, mid 20th century um, uh, uh, experiences of Second World War. So I uh, close uh, by, by um, repeating my, um, my appeal to um, take these post-1989 experiences much more seriously than we have done before, both in Poland and in Germany. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, I invite now Pavel to continue the so conversation. Thank you very much for having me here. I am the already the first speaker and many wise things have been already said, <laughs> so my job is more difficult. I, I will try to uh, tackle this subject perhaps from a little bit different angle. Uh, I would begin by an, a rather obvious statement that history has always played a very important role in the Polish-German relations, also after 89, after the collapse of the communism and the unification of Germany. Uh, but I would say that uh, in the last two de decades, history played mostly the destructive role. And it started well before uh, law and justice took power in Poland. Uh, the paradox is that the uh, more time passes since <laughs> the end of the Second World War, the more divisive factor it turns out to be. Uh, this process had various stages, and at first it all looked more optimistic than uh, eventually it turned out to be. So the first stage were obviously the uh, 1990s, and when we look back at this time, I would say that it was a period of the recon reconciliation enthusiasm, at least in Poland. Uh, we had Polish-German uh, treaties from 1990 and 91. We had important, important sy symbolic gestures like a meeting uh, between uh, Helmut Kohl and Tadeusz Mazowiecki in November 89 mm -hmm. in Krzyżowa, Kreisau, uh, the place itself historically symbolic uh, because at this very place during the Second World War, the anti-Nazi conspirators held their meetings uh, at the estate belonging to von Moltke family. In the 1990s, Polish historians and the Polish public opinion explored the topics which were uh, silence during the communist time, mostly the topic of the post-war expulsions of Germans from Poland. Uh, there was a massive research uh, conducted by Polish historians, but also with a cooperation with German researchers, and many important books and historical documents were published regarding this most sensitive topic on expulsions. And paradoxically enough, this topic did not evoke great controversies in Poland, and it was not exploited politically by, by any major group. Uh, this serenity ended abruptly around the year 2000. And it had nothing to do with the Polish politics. It had, had mostly to do with the activities of the German Union of Expellees, its chairperson, Erika Steinbach, uh, and uh, the idea to create in Berlin a, a museum commemorating the expulsions of German, post-war expulsions of German from Poland and Czechoslovakia. And something which was very destructive was a very aggressive rhetoric used by Erika Steinbach to emphasize the Polish responsibility and the brutality with which the expulsions were carried out and also the claims uh, that expelled Germans should get the financial compensation or even should get back their property left in Poland. And there was an almost unanimous indignation of the Polish public opinion and of all major political forces uh, regarding these uh, claims. They were rejected, and it was a very unique case of such a broad political unanimity in Poland, which you could uh, almost never find uh, in case of other topics. Uh, there were widespread fears in Poland that uh, these narratives about expellees, uh, also narratives focusing on the sufferings of German civilians during the war, under the bombardments of Elias, uh, of women raped by the, by the Red Army, uh, that it would somehow change the self-perceptions of Germans and the, uh, how the German fate in the Second World War was perceived by other nations, that it would 
in putting, putting it in a nutshell, but it would somehow uh, turn Germans from being perceived as perpetrators to being perceived as victims. I uh, re relate here this Polish sensitiveness, which was certainly exaggerated, but it, what I am saying now reflected the fears, concerns of, in my opinion, of a very important par part of the Polish public opinion, not only the right wing. And you should remember that at exactly at the same time, it was the very beginning of the uh, years 2000s, we had a very emotional, dramatical, and traumatic discussion about Jedwabne. It was the beginning of a discussion about Poles killing Jews during the Second World War. So altogether, these two topics combined, the topic of the expulsion of Germans from Poland after the Second World War and the topic of Polish complicity in the Holocaust, uh, put in Joe Party Polish historical self-perceptions based on exceptional vict victimhood and heroism. And there was a backlash, uh, which in my opinion was inevitable. Uh, this backlash took shape of the conservative politics of history. This concept was shaped fair by, first by the conservative historians and then very soon adopted by the Law and Justice Party. And basically, according to this concept, all these dealings with the sensitive, dark sides of the Polish history, like anti-Semitism, like Jedwabne, like expulsions of Germans, was a part of the so-called history of shame. So uh, uh, the, most of the Polish liberal, liberal elites, also historians, were accused of self-castigating themselves and the Polish nation. And the response should be the political, politics of history, which would promote the history of pride. So an approach focusing on the only glorious parts of the Polish history. And a part, of, and of course, uh, dealing with expulsions of Germans was uh, presented as uh, uh, the best example of this mm, history of shame. And very soon, uh, the law and justice made politics of history and this history of pride one of the pillars of their ideology, politics, and it was very consistent in it continued over years. Uh, and it had a very clear anti-German angle from the very beginning. The first time the German anti-German phobia was exploited politically, explicitly, was in the uh, presidential campaign in 2005, when Donald Tusk was accused that his grandfather volunteered to Wehrmacht. Uh, as it very soon turned out, uh, Tusk's grandfather was forcibly drafted to Wehrmacht, as almost 400,000 other Poles who lived in the territories incorporated into the German Reich. But it was just the foretaste of what the law and justice would do with history and would do with the Polish-German uh, relations. In 2007, the law and justice lost power, but this anti-German phobia continued and uh, remained as the core of their politics of history. Uh, uh, it could be very well seen when you analyze the responses of the Law and Justice Party towards the idea of creating the Museum of the Second World War in Gdańsk. Uh, I suggested this idea in an article in, published in 2007 in the Polish press. I argued that instead of being stuck in a sort of a stalemate, stalemate uh, uh, regarding this um, narrative in Germany about expulsions, uh, we should create in Poland a museum that would present the overall history of uh, the Second World War, uh, including, of course, the German occupation, the German terror against Poles. This idea was uh, taken up by Donald Tusk, who became the prime minister, and Tusk decided that such a, such a museum should be built in Poland. In my idea, his concept was that history should be moved away from the political agenda between Poland and Germany, and it would be better if uh, historians and museums deal with such sensitive issues instead of having them in the core of the Polish-German current politics. And the response of the Law and Justice Party was very vehement. They attacked this idea of creating the Museum of the Second World War, uh, and they presented it as 
uh, serving German interests uh, as a, an idea to create the museum that would somehow exculpate uh, Germans from their uh, responsibility for starting the Second World War and for committing atrocities upon Poles. I would give you just one uh, quotation from Jarosław Kaczyński. He said that on, in a TV interview that Germans never repaid their obligations to Poland and that they imposed their politics of history on us. The Museum of the Second World War in Gdańsk, such a special gift of Donald Tusk to Angela Merkel, is nothing else but an, inscri an inscription into the German politics of history. So these statements were just uh, reflected the growing phobia, animosity towards Germany in the ranks of the Law and Justice Party, but it also, they, it also re reflected the uh, political strategy of exploiting anti-German phobia, anti-German rhetoric. And Germany has been accused uh, of an intent to subjugate Poland politically, culturally, economically, sometimes in a full cooperation with Russia. Uh, Kaczyński and uh, other politicians of the Law and Justice Party uh, mentioned such a term, German Russian condominium over Poland. And they suggested that it was a covered, a hidden idea of Angela Merkel. And it all clearly resonated with the memory of the Hitler-Stalin Pact in 1939 and the subsequent joint aggression and occupation of Poland. Germany was also accused of, of a deliberate attempt to shift from its shoulders the responsibility for the Holocaust and to put it on the shoulders of the Poles. And uh, only when you remember us about this anti-German phobia, you can understand why the Polish government attacked so vehemently Polish historians who were dealing with the Polish complicity with the Holocaust. So it was all the road that step by step led to the reparation claims made officially by peace in the year 2022. In my opinion, it was mostly directed at the internal targets at the Polish public opinion in order to mobilize law and justice constituency, to ostracize law and justice uh, opponents as traitors, as Berlin's lackeys. And I would say that the damage made to the Polish-German relations were only collateral because peace did not care at all about foreign relations. It was all, all about internal politics. But this is the legacy that we face now not only the new government in Poland, but the Polish historians, Polish public opinion, and how to find a <coughs> way out from this deadlock, I think it's a very difficult question. Perhaps we will discuss it during our open discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so to conclude the first part of the discussion, I invite Claudia. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, much has already uh, been said about um, the reconciliation. I, again will uh, add my thoughts on this topic. But uh, first of all, thanks for the invitation. And I'm really uh, happy to be here and to discuss with you the current state of the German-Polish relations, as well as even uh, to share some thoughts on uh, what I would call an understanding of reconciliation uh, that has characterized uh, the German-Polish relations after the end of the Cold War um, and has and was at the same time, so I would argue, one reason, but not the only one, of course, uh, for a quite harsh awakening, uh, at least uh, on the German side. Um, and I would call this, this first period of reconciliation during the 90s uh, this period of noble dreams, or noble hopes, uh, that, uh, and I'm here to talk about the disappointment of reconciliation, so, and uh, these noble hopes that were uh, disappointed. And so, and I thought I might well start with an uh, episode of my personal disappointment uh, during a visit uh, to Warsaw about seven years ago. And I guess you all know those um, posters in the streets of Warsaw. It was the first time when I saw them uh, on which uh, Germans were called upon to, in, in very sharp tones, 
uh, to finally pay uh, for the crimes of their grandfathers. So it was all over in Warsaw, you remember, of course, those posters. And uh, for me, I mean, at this time I was at the um, German Historical Institute in Warsaw, and I was really struck and I was irritated and I really felt personally hurt uh, because uh, I was in this beautiful old palace in uh, the German Historical Institute in Warsaw and we were supposed to talk about uh, prospects of German-Polish academic cooperation and outside this beautiful surrounding and academic uh, community uh, there were obviously th uh, things were happening um, that I at this point really thought were over, old-fashioned, uh, foreign and uh, completely out of date. So, and since then I really asked the question, what did I miss? What uh, have I not seen, haven't I seen? Uh, and uh, for the sake of the argument and for today's discussion, I would call this, what I missed, uh, the dark side of uh, reconciliation, or at least its um, ambivalences. And I <coughs> would make today for our discussion three arguments about this dark side of uh, reconciliation. So, uh, my first argument is uh, that the historical reconciliation between Germany and uh, Poland, as it was meant uh, in this earlier time, in the 90s, implied a certain uh, teleology, and therefore it was conceived as a linear process. As such, I guess, it in a very fine way uh, reflected the contemporary worldview after the end of the Cold War, so this end of history illusion, or uh, this this end of history thought, so as a teleolo teleology, as a linear process. Um, the problem was uh, that we had absolutely no concept of what would follow reconciliation and uh, what would happen after a successful reconciliation. And I'm not even sure if uh, we had a successful reconciliation and most fundamentally what would constitute this successful reconciliation after all. So should it mean uh, the redemption of all Germans from historical guilt and should then the Polish side proclaim this redemption? So and then if the Polish side proclaims this redemption then when? on what terms? So when was um, reconciliation fulfilled? Um, so that's my first point. The second point is uh, the talk of, I think the talk of historical reconciliation had a paternalistic and hegemonic component uh, reflecting a quite modern Western view on Eastern Europe. Uh, to put it simply, it was a process that was supposed to proceed mostly according to German ideas about the content and form that reconciliation should take. So who thought about what, how would reconciliation look like? Um, it was a process peppered with insensitivity, with ignorance, and uh, the we have got the money, money attitude. Uh, and it also existed in my city of Frankfurt Oder. Uh, here I have to accept our German locals reacted quite with perplexity uh, to the Polish hesitation to rebuild plans of a view tower in Swubice that was erected in the 19th century to commemorate a fallen German soldier and poet. So, and this was a project uh, to rebuild this view tower in Swubice. It was a project as part of reconciliation. And nobody uh, in the German, uh, on the German side asked the question, question why the Polish side uh, should be interested in re 
building this view tower, remembering, uh, recommemorating, commemorating a German, a fallen German soldier at all. So nobody asked this question. Um, it, even, it even didn't occur to the project planners. So, um, and I guess this was not meant maliciously at all, but it was rather an expression of a kind of self-centered blindness towards the other supposedly inferior side, um, which was expected to be grateful for the benevolence and the economic benefits of the historical reconciliation process. Uh, so it was a kind of a, a symmetry of power, and I guess that this a symmetry of power resurfaced as a conflict in the reparations debate, or when the peace government uh, took its own claims to extremes in a deliberate political provocation. My third argument is, um, or it's aimed uh, at focusing on reconciliation as an object of research in order to create a more complex picture that includes all the ambivalences, contradictions, and the dark sides. And in that regard, our reconciliation should be analyzed as a part of geopolitics. And I think reconciliation is a part of geopolitics. Um, during, it was, it has been during the 90s, and uh, today it's also part of geopolitics. And in doing so, so if we analyze reconciliation or take it as a research topic, uh, then the term might lose its teleological touch. Moreover, I hope that uh, the internal te teleology itself uh, becomes part of a power and, uh, or is seen as part of a power and geopolitical strategy in a very specific historical constellation and temporality. So I want to conclude um, in looking at today's uh, German-Polish relationship and I have the impression now that, as I guess Carolina already said, the high point of the reparation conflict and the rhetoric of reconciliation in German-Polish relations is over. At the first glance, it seems that it has given way to uh, geopolitical pragmatism uh, in war times and that this applies to both sides. However, I'm not sure whether that's the case or whether we are instead witnessing a quite interesting spin in the German-Polish relationship regarding geopolitics, memory and reconciliation. So, and my example is uh, the last uh, Bundestag debate on Polish-German uh, relation that uh, happened on February 22nd. And uh, here, um, the words of the German government's current Poland representative, Dietmar Neitan, he's from the Social Democrats, really attract my intention, attention in a sense um, that the German government currently appears to be prepared to pay reparations, all by without calling them that. In his speech, um, and I will, would really like to quote him, um, Nathan uh, said literally, uh, even if the chapter of reparations is formally closed in legal terms, the question remains as to what Germany can still do to make amends and show that we have understood the lessons of history. This chapter is not yet closed. The Polish foreign minister has rightly called on the German side to show creativity and deliver something in this regard. So my question is if uh, the new government in Warsaw, uh, in Warsaw now in a way, is in a way 
using the current geopolitical constellation just to jump on the bandwagon of the peace uh, memory politics. Thank you. Thank you very much. So thank you to all of our uh, guests for those outstanding introductions, um, which really gets us into the background to the current situation from, well, before 1989 and then running until the present and the new Polish government. And it's very interesting to hear uh, the response uh, of, the, uh, of a member of the German government to uh, these uh, points that Radosław Sikorski made on his mm -hmm. first trip to Germany, seeking creative solutions. So I was yeah, very interested you know. to hear that uh, response. So I think at this point, I'd like to uh, open the discussion uh, to all of you uh, in the room. Uh, so if you could uh, ra raise your hand uh, if you have a question or a comment, and perhaps either to direct at a particular speaker or uh, a general question. Uh, Brendan Sims. So I'm Brendan Sims, director of the Center for Geopolitics. Thank you for four excellent uh, sets of comments. One area that I thought wasn't so much discussed was the um, question of the uh, Western uh, European critique of the rule of law in Poland, and how this played into um, these discussions. You, you maybe took it for red, as red, but I wondered, could you say a little bit more about that? To what extent the history was also being instrumentalized as a, as, as a sort of riposte to those uh, criticisms coming from Berlin and from Brussels? So if I may suggest, I think if we take a few questions, uh, and then we could perhaps go through in order of our speakers uh, to give some response, uh, responses to whichever of the questions uh, they feel best qualified to, to answer. And if you could follow Brendan's example and, and perhaps briefly introduce yourself, uh, if you uh, don't mind, uh, when you ask your question. Yes, at the back. Hello, I'm Katrina. I'm a postgraduate student doing um, politics, uh, doing a politics master. I'm German, <laughs> so I was very interested in this today, but also I have a background in memory studies, um, and this actually relates to the question that I'm going to ask, or two interconnected questions I'm going to ask. The first one relates to the recognition of the Namibian genocide in Germany, and whether that opened a window of opportunity for sort of reparation payments that are being asked by other countries. Um, and then in the Namibian case, non-state actors played a very, very fundamental role in getting the genocide recognized by the German government. So I'm wondering to what extent non-state actors are playing a role in, in Polish-German um, relations and reparations. Thank you. Move away from politics and just ask your opinion about the level of human relations, people to people, leaving politics aside. What do you think is the relation of Poles to Germans on a private basis? And also, I'd just like to ask, remind you that reparation, Hitler's um, Germany ap appropriated all Polish properties in Germany, and no reparations were ever paid to anybody of, re of the, uh, um, of the um, assets taken from Poles living in Germany before the war. And secondly, Poland has recognized a German minority in Poland, but the Germans, with over a million Poles living in Germany, don't recognize Poles as a minority and don't fund anything that's to do with Polish language, culture, literature, or anything like that. So there is a great imbalance, and I'd like you to address those kind of issues on the personal human level. Perhaps take one more question in this first round and then get some responses. You wait for the second one? Unless, I think if you get in now, Donatas, okay. and then, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, Donatas Kupchuna, Center for Geopolitics. Uh, you must have received a few unsolicited emails from me uh, before, so it's finally good to match faces to uh, names. Um, I was just wondering about the German side of this. So uh, what about the right-wing opinion in Germany? Because, you know, what the, they could do, they could say, want to talk the Second World War, you know, fine, let's talk the Second World War, you know, what about Posen and, and Danzig, and maybe you should pay rent, right? So uh, is there any sort of uh, reaction there, and uh, does it empower, uh, in a way, the, the right in Germany, these sorts of claims? Thank you. 
Thank you very much. So for the, that first round of questions, um, and as I said, if you answer any of those questions that you are interested in responding to. So Carolina, if you perhaps begin. Thank you. Those were fascinating questions. And at the same time, I must say that so many uh, thoughts of my co-panelists were also profound and important that I would like to react, but I will try to be brief. Um, so um, Professor Barcz, this is the person in Poland who basically uh, is trying to develop exactly such strategy about think, uh, of thinking about reparations that you have, um, you have uh, summarized uh, 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 according to, to Dieter, Dieter Nitan's words. Yeah. Uh, namely, that Poland will eventually accept something which is not called reparations, but is money. <laughs> um, this is, I think this is an interesting development because it is taking place on both sides. Mm -hmm. So the same way of creating thinking is taking place on both sides, and I think this, this might lead us somewhere. Um, now, um, I, I would like to, to, to react to the, to the rule of law question, because I, I do believe that the rule of law question has been uh, one of the most profound during the, the past eight years. And I, I do agree that there, there has been something about um, Brussels and Berlin preaching, right? Um, of course, Berlin was very uh, uh, um, uh, sober about preaching Poland about the rule of law. What Berlin actually prepare, preferred was that it is not done directly from Berlin. Uh, it is done by the European Union. And actually, rightly so, uh, because we belong to, to the European Union as countries. This is our, uh, our uh, uh, um, uh, um, uh, the home of our countries. But as for the, the rule of law, I would like to, to, to say some, something else. Um, it is very important to, uh, to, to understand where the line of polarization actually goes in contemporary Poland. It is not a line of uh, polarization between some conservative right and some liberal left, but it is a line between those who believe that the constitution from 1997 should be respected and those who believe that, well, not necessarily. So it is actually a line between liberal Democrats as, as, as liberal democracy is defined by its respect to the rule of law, and the populists who actually believe that nation is above the law. And when I say that, I actually refer to, 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 to concrete quotations from the Polish parliament life. Like the nation is above the law. Uh, this is what the late father of uh, the former Prime Minister, uh, 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 Mateusz Morawiecki, his name was Kornel Morawiecki, he got a standing ovation from the whole parliament for saying that, right? So I think this is, this is much more important uh, than, um, I, I, uh, no, it's, it's very important to underline that because then when we see that, we also can ask a very important question. Uh, my panelists have been very, very right to underline how peace has manipulated with anti-German sentiments. I couldn't agree more. But the question is, why did the democratic opposition and why does the current government use the same melody? Uh, uh, um, an attempt to answer is, um, it looks as if the electorate groups that are being mobilized by the uh, former opposition to their government are also prone to some kind of rhetoric. Because obviously, Civic Platform is not speaking to the electorate of peace. This is obvious. So they are speaking to their own electorate. Ergo, what is the reason for which the liberal voters in Poland are eager to listen to this? What has happened? <coughs> My argument is that it's not connected with Poland as such, or German-Polish relations, it is connected with the war in Ukraine mm -hmm. and the change of constellation of, uh, of it is connected with, with the new geopolitical position of Poland. 
but it is also connected with how East Central Europe perceives itself and its role and its, mm, 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 and its diagnosis, whether they were right or wrong. And I think this, this is perhaps the, the crucial thing here. Uh, because otherwise we can, of course, endlessly uh, 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 analyze Mr. Kaczynski and how uh, he is extremely radical, but at, at the same time, he is also extremely effective because he has still one third of the vote in Poland. So we can endlessly do that, but I do believe that, you know, you, we have had a new government for a couple of months now. And, and, this is, and this is telling. So I do believe that what is happening to Polish-German relations is, 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 is newer than the whole story that we have behind those troubled relations. It is actually, the reason is geopolitical. I do, yeah. Thank you very much. Um, oh, perhaps, Claudia, do you want to leap straight in now? I just wanted now, to uh, reply that I totally agree with you that we really have to see uh, the German, at the moment, the German-Polish relation against the background of the Ukrainian war. And uh, in this uh, debate that I mentioned in the Bundestag, uh, all the people uh, um, talked about the revitalization of the Weimarer Dreieck. The, the Weimar Triangle, how would you call Weimar this? Triangle, Weimar yeah. Triangle, yeah. So, and this meant this is interesting because then uh, the, I guess now in the moment uh, in Europe we see this um, alliance or axis of, of Paris, Paris, uh, Berlin, and Warsaw. And it's so interesting to see how Paris and Warsaw uh, talk about uh, money, the money for the Ukrainian war, and uh, how uh, then reparations come into this picture. Mm -hmm. if, if I could just add one quick point on the rule of law, which is to say that I, I think this was relatively marginal in the end, that yes, it's true that this was conceived, I think in part, the question of historical guilt as a kind of moral blackmail that could be used uh, as a form of negotiating tool uh, with Western partners over this pressure that was growing over rule of law. There's a telling um, a line in Jaroslav Kaczynski's autobiography where he describes a meeting with an Austrian diplomat in the 1990s when that diplomat advised him, you should use their guilt. They feel guilty yeah. about you, use it, you use will it. get what yeah. you want. Yeah. And then he says, shente słowa, right? So holy words, literally. So the God's own truth, right, He's, is, his, is the way. So that to some degree, but first of all, it didn't work, it didn't work at all. And in fact, the pressure continued to grow. And secondly, the actual question of reparations formally, the claim for 1.3 trillion US dollars didn't come until late 2022. And as Carolina, I think, rightly says, this geopolitical context needs to be brought into account here. And secondly, it was just second, it, and as Pavel, I think, also correctly pointed out earlier, um, the, the, the question of the foreign relations aspect was secondary to the domestic. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, was a dom it was above all a domestic political question. And yes, there was some thought that it could be used as a tool of foreign policy. And to some degree within this rule of law context, but it seems to me that it was less significant. Um, perhaps if we uh, go to uh, Florian. To, yeah, uh, maybe. Um, uh, honestly, I'm not, not that much an expert on geopolitics, so I would like to relate to uh, the, those parts of the questions which were more directed, uh, more pointed to the, to the social, uh, uh, societal level of, of conflicts. For example, the question about the, the German right wing and, and the question of, of what this debate, uh, whether this debate on, on reparations would, would be like anything uh, anything supporting or, or supportive for German right-wing uh, parties, I would say no for one very simple reason, because these reparation claims are not even, they are not a political issue in Germany, because th this is not to be not taken seriously at all, so there's no, no, real, rela no real political force for any, there's nothing to gain by, by relating to that. And I would even uh, extend this argument a little bit, because um, we are talking so much about um, history and memory, and uh, maybe I'm not in a good position as a German to make this make this point here. Um, but what uh, Pavel told us about all these uh, all these fears um, um, uh, caused by the by the initiatives of German right wing, then then uh, German right wing uh, politicians like Erika Steinbach in the in the early uh, after 2000s. Um, uh, all these fears uh, uh, yeah, caused in, in uh, across Polish society, actually. Um, this, this 
would be would be I think nowadays this would be um, impossible simply because these people do not exist anymore in a political sense and also in a biological sense in a way because these German expellee generation so to speak is simply yeah there are only very few of them are amongst us today um, so so what happened actually uh, or what we see in Germany is is um, a, um, that this ignorance we have um, deplored here on the podium, also, also myself, uh, uh, we have deplored this German ignorance towards Polish um, sensitivities and so on. This also, in a certain sense, can be seen as a blessing because this ignorance also is, of course, um, um, very, uh, very uh, a good thing if it comes to the, to the memory of the former German East. Yeah? There is much ignorance in German society about the German German history of Breslau or something or, or Stettin or something. No one is, well, very few people are actually interested in that and this is of course a very, very, it is a blessing in a way for, for uh, Polish-German relations because on the German side um, uh, this, this right-wing uh, argument um, which would be very much in place, well if the, if the Poles want reparations, so okay, let's Look how much uh, property was there in, in Breslau and Stettin. Yeah? So, so we should offset that, actually, because this is more complicated in, as in the case uh, of Namibia, for example, or in the case of Greece and so on. Uh, in the Polish-German case, um, one, one would have to think about uh, these, these issues if, if we talk about repression. But this argument is not made, actually, out of German ignorance. So this is a blessing, I guess, for, for this point. Maybe one... one, um, one well, and one more skeptical point, a uh, more skeptical note on these search for creative solutions. Because creative solutions is exactly what has been done all the time uh, from 1990, 1991 onwards. This, this was all the, all the ideas of, of um, yeah, setting up this Polish-German Reconciliation Foundation and so on. This was always a creative solution to not to talk about reparations. Yeah? And uh, to circumvent actually this, and to avoid all, all the, any any legal legal construction, and I don't really see that that any um, creative solution will, uh, will will be enough to to um, uh, satisfy the th symbolic need of recognition uh, on parts of the Polish society, and and uh, I think this. As, as I've uh, um, argued before, um, I don't think this is uh, only a historical and, and symbolically uh, founded, founded um, need or, or uh, longing for, for recognition, but it's pretty much, um, pretty much part of a biographical experience of, of um, yeah, actually, actually the, 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 the generation of Poles who, who mostly vote or have voted for peace um, in, the, in the last elections. Yes, to to put a number on it, by the way, it's as of the last uh, public opinion survey from the big public pollster in August 2023, it was 59% of polls believed that Germany should pay reparations. Uh, of course, it breaks down by a party, so it's 88% of peace supporters, about 20% of civic coalition supporters, but it had been as high as 69% in 2019. But, but you know, it's, 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 a, it's a majority of Polish society. Um, Pavel. Uh, yes, first uh, uh, about uh, Brendan's question about the rule of law. I, I don't think it was really important. Of course, it was somehow exploited by the law and justice, uh, but you should remember that the German government was very restrained in criticizing the, uh, you know, all uh, political and legal abuses in Poland. It was so restrictive, so restrained that many people in the then opposition were very disappointed with the German government. I myself was disappointed also, although I understood that the, no, no German government can really preach um, you know, polls on anything, but still I thought that Angela Merkel's restraint uh, somehow resembled the Ostpolitik from the 70s, you know, dealing with the communist government and ignoring the opposition. So it was not so easy for the law and justice to point at Berlin saying that the Germans are criticizing you know, the abuses of the uh, law in Poland. It was mostly the criticism against the European Union, against Brussels, but uh, such a construction was created and exploited that uh, the European Union is simply manipulated by Germany. And uh, in, in the nutshell, even if Brussels some says 
something, it means that Berlin says that. But I think that still was less important uh, in terms of anti-German narrative than history. History was really uh, used uh, at every you know, corner of the street, as Claudia noticed and mentioned these posters. Uh, when you went to a, an airport in Warsaw, you came across an exhibition about German crimes. When you spend vacations in the Polish mountains, you go to a popular resort, uh, you come across at the main square at an outdoor ex exhibition about German crimes with horrible photographs of you know, poles uh, shot by the uh, German police. So it was all true, of course, but it was uh, overused. It, uh, was, uh, it became a sort of historical phobia and this argument that the Germans wanted to somehow exculpate themselves from the responsibility for the Holocaust and they somehow supported those Polish historians that you know, did new groundbreaking research about the Polish uh, you know, complicity uh, in the Holocaust. Uh, now, uh, the question from the gentleman in the audience, uh, uh, how did it affect the you know, society at large? Uh, in that respect, I am uh, more optimistic. Uh, I think that this anti-German phobia uh, was somehow persuasive, mostly for the law and justice constituency, let's say one third of the society. Uh, uh, when you look at the results of the opinion polls, uh, you would see that uh, around, as far as, far as I remember, 70% of Poles have a positive opinion of the current German state, of, of Germany, of Germans. It, these positive opinions dropped a few points during the law and justice eight years in power, but still, this is a very positive uh, you know, perception of our neighbors, and I think that uh, there is a very dense network of contacts, uh, social contacts, you know, around one million Poles live in Germany, they work in Germany, uh, many hundreds of thousands of Poles live in western parts of Poland adjacent to the border and they spend the week working in Berlin, for example, and then they go back uh, home for weekends. So there is a very dense network of you know, connections on a human level which uh, I think makes a very optimistic ground for uh, any attempt to somehow rebuild confidence, not only between the nations, but with, between the, the, you know, the official institutions. Uh, now, uh, Katrina asked about Namibia. I think that uh, this case was mostly ignored in the Polish public discourse. Another uh, case was more vividly discussed, Greece. Greece, as another country who made the reparations claims, made in a very similar way to the law and justice. It was purely instrumental, without any real hope that <laughs> the Germany would pay these reparations. But uh, when uh, Jarosław Kaczyński uh, you know, kept saying about reparations, about Polish claims, he said that we could create an alliance with Greeks and with the Jews, he said also, uh, with Israel and the uh, <laughs> worldwide uh, uh, jury. Uh, and it didn't work so far for some reasons. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, and I would also refer to what was said by my panelists, fellow panelists, and I would slightly disagree, or perhaps even seriously disagree with uh, Carolina and Claudia. I, if I understood you correctly, you said that the current Polish government somehow continues this, I don't know how to say it, anti-German line, uh, you know, the cl reparation claims. I wouldn't put it in that way. Uh, this government is acting in the situation of a, I would call it a patriotic blackmail. Uh, it's not uh, easy politically to simply abandon all claims regarding uh, you know, the German financial responsi responsibility for all damage what, which was done to Poland. Uh, Tusk and Sikorski, they admitted that legally the issue is closed, they, they are aware of it. And for that they were, they, they were very vehemently criticized by the law and justice politicians. But Sikorski and Tusk keep saying that still there is an issue on the table of some German 
efforts to compensate, to, 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 to financially, morally, politically compensate for all uh, these horrible crimes and damage which was done to Poles and to Poland. And Sikorsky even mentioned that uh, perhaps uh, the German government could consider uh, co-financing rebuilding of Saski Palace, Pałac Saski in Warsaw. Uh, I'm not a great fan of rebuilding another palace in the middle of Warsaw. <laughs> I think that we have more important needs. So I, I, I oh, see in, palace in the middle of Berlin. Yeah, I, I, I can see in no, that uh, uh, a way somehow to get the Germans committed into, you know, financially um, contributing to some kind of reconstruction which would be perceived as a, as a, as a sort of a, a reparation. Uh, I think that some also moral gestures are needed from the German side and such gestures, in my opinion, are forthcoming. This is mostly the project of creating in Berlin the Deutsch Polish House, uh, the Polish German House, mm -hmm. which would be uh, a museum basically about Polish German relations with a focus on the occupation of Poland. And I think this is a very good idea, perhaps not for the sake of millions of Poles who are not interested in museums, but on this elite level, which is perhaps not the, the only important level, but still it counts. In my opinion, it could be one of the gestures which would be somehow uh, needed uh, in the situation we have now. Can I have an ad bottom on this? Because um, I do believe... Very I briefly. I, uh, yes, please. Yeah, I, I yeah. mean, I was waiting for this moment because this is such an interesting issue. And I do believe that uh, um, Pavel is right. There are many people who simply see uh, continuation here. But the right question, I believe, is, is the, the, the following one. Why Polish foreign policy under civic platform is so similar and so different at the same time? What makes it similar is the rhetoric, for example, reparations. Uh, it's also uh, what uh, Radek Sikorski himself says, we need a serious discussion with the Germans about their attitudes to history and reparations and, and so on and so on. But what is different is very, something extremely deep. This is the attitude to the trauma I, has been, I have been talking about. Here we have a question. If we have a trauma, a historic trauma, what, does it, what can it mean for geopolitics? You might use the software that has been used by Jarosław Kaczyński, uh, namely Polish isolationism. Let's isolate ourselves from the East because it's dangerous, of course. Putin's Russia is dangerous, obviously it's aggressive, but also from the West because the West will betray us as they have done in the 20th century. This is exactly the software of the Second Polish Republic uh, and this is what Kaczyński has been using. Now, um, there is also another so software and this is the software that is, using, uh, that is being used by Donald Tusk and Radek Sikorski. This is a completely different interpretation of the, of the consequences of the trauma. If we know from history that Russia has been coming uh, to, to its Western uh, neighbors again and again and again. And we know also from the past that the West could be either also aggressive or uh, simply uh, would look away. What do we do? We make alliances as tough as possible. This is our answer. This is their geopolitical answer. Actually, I, 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 I understand the, the Weimar Triangle attempt exactly as this attempt. Listen. This is something new in comparison with reconciliation. Reconciliation, as you said, is a linear thing. It's like Rolf Nickel's book, mm -hmm. like um, the, 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 the enemies, the strangers, the friends. This is exactly how reconciliation has been understood. Mm -hmm. But what Tusk and Sikorsky are doing together, I believe, with Macron and with Scholz is something completely different. They basically set a, quite another goal. It's a goal of having an, uh, 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 allies, not friends. It's not about being friends, it's about being allies. What is the difference between friends and allies? I believe you can be disappointed with your friend. You can have many sentiments, you can be hurt, you can demand empathy. 
But allies do not demand empathy. They think about each other. It's not that we can do with our allies something. We must do something with our, our ally. And Russia and Ukraine is, of course, the best reason to do it. Right? So I do believe this is the post-reconciliation epoch. We don't have any reconciliation anymore. What we have is a very serious talk about what, what, what alliance means in contemporary Europe and environment triangle uh, attempts to revitalize this idea that has never been sexy, but now has never been sexier. Um, <laughs> this is exactly it. This is exactly it. Mm. Um, I, so let's, we're, running, we're running very short on time, so let's oh, really? turn to okay. Claudia um, for any responses to Carolina's uh, interesting um, responses now or, or to the, the questions that we had from the floor. Yeah, uh, maybe I can just add something to your question about uh, the German-Polish relation on a daily basis and how they live together. So. I think uh, as everyone, I mean, since I, I live on the border to Poland, and so we have uh, good relations, bad relations, so quite a normal, usual stuff, uh, friends, and uh, so it, it's, it's as everywhere. Uh, but something changed during the last years, I would say. So where are... During the 90s and also in the early uh, 2000s, um, people, especially in Germany, uh, looked uh, to Poland as or went to Poland because it was cheaper there and uh, um, they went to to shop there. And uh, but it was still seen as um, the Poles are not so rich, they are poor, they, they work for us on the Esperangus fields, and, um, and this changed. I guess now, um, at least people um, in my neighborhood, um, people I talk to, uh, are really impressed by uh, the progress and uh, Poland has made over the last couple of years. And now uh, they go to, to Breslau or go to Warsaw and recognize that there, for instance, uh, the internet is much more better than in Berlin. And uh, that uh, Warsaw now is such a modern, wonderful city uh, so they compare, for instance, Berlin to Warsaw, and for them, <laughs> Warsaw looks much more better than Berlin. So, and, and it really changed. Uh, so there is more acknowledgement of uh, what Poland did uh, during the last um, two, three decades, and that there is a very, very impressive uh, development, economic development, too. So... Um, yeah, I guess that yeah that really changed, and I just um, want I really would like to discuss uh, uh, with you uh, this geopolitical question um, because I I would argue that it has never been about friendship. I mean, also reconciliation. That's my argument. Was uh, a geopolitical strategy, and uh, I would uh, really like to analyze reconciliation as such, as part of geopolitics, also during the 90s. It was sold as more as friendship. Um, and now it's, of course, this is, this is uh, realpolitik. This is geopolitics in wartime. It's about alliances. So, uh, but that doesn't necessarily mean uh, that this time uh, Poland will not be disappointed again. So there's no guarantee. And uh, I guess it's, it's, a, it's, yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting, it's a very, very interesting situation at the moment in Europe. Um, and with great interest, I observed this, this uh, rebuilding of political alliances. 
Uh, and it's not so much, I guess, about, and it's, it's interesting to look at the Weimar Triangle um, uh, and to see also the, um, how would I call this, um, the competition. It's not an equal game, it's a competition among uh, pa Paris, uh, Berlin, and Warsaw. So, yeah. So, uh, Donatus, are we able to go 10 minutes over for a quick round of final comments and then an, a, a one minute summation from each of our speakers? Can you authorize that? Uh, so do we, uh, could, could I, ha thank you. <laughs> uh, could I have some raised hands for any uh, final, very brief questions or comments, and then if we have a final one minute summation uh, or a key point that, that you want to get across uh, from our speakers, we have run out of time. Brent. I'm really asking, so I'll, I'll wait until the So let's, yeah, let's I'll, get I'll some wait. other voices, yes? Yes. So Claudia Wontinska, University of Warsaw. Um, a very short question, how to teach history, uh, especially the history of the, the Second World War, so that it does not become instrument of political propaganda? Charles Clark, I work at the, I'm uh, co-lead with Brendan, the Baltic Geopolitics Program. That last question is highly relevant. Uh, one of our advisors is Thomas Matusek, who used to be the German ambassador in London. And when I was Secretary of State for Education, it was a constant dialogue about how Germany was taught in English schools and the English school curriculum. It's a very, very real question. He made the point quite correctly that actually in English schools, almost all you learn about Germany is the history of Nazism. And what about all the other dimensions of Germany? And I think that I just wanted to say that question. But however, my, my, my question was this. I've had, I have difficulty myself in taking the whole reparations uh, claims very seriously. Whether it applies to reparations for slavery and the issues now with the church in England or many, many issues through the world, which isn't to say the issue of guilt isn't very, very important and what happened, but to translate the history into a, f a current invoice strikes me as a very difficult process, which I have difficulty t in even contemplating. You've been tremendous this, this evening. I found it really helpful. Thank you in your thinking. But my question is, how seriously, in your opinion, do the two governments, the Polish government and the German government now, take this issue? Is it very high on their agenda? Uh, obviously, there's a large number of issues which are important in the bilateral relations, economic security, and so on and so forth. Is this a big question for them, or is it really pretty marginal to find some kind of solution on the edge? Thank you. Uh, yes, sir, in the front here. Thank you very much. Uh, Trevelyan Wing uh, at the Center for Geopolitics. Um, you mentioned the Weimar Triangle and this question of um, you know, alliance versus friendship. And I wonder, especially now that Tusk and we have a new government in, um, in Warsaw, um, to what extent um, you know, Poland might become, in fact, a third engine, for example. You know, we always talk about the Franco-German engine for European integration and how that might potentially affect this balance between alliance and friendship. Thank you. Uh, we have in the, in, the, in the corner there. Thank you very much. Uh, Isabella Paszko, LMU Munich. Uh, I have one question maybe addressed to Paweł Machcewicz. Uh, I would like to ask you about your opinion on uh, Polish-German Commission for History uh, textbook for uh, for schools uh, in both countries, or maybe other panelists can uh, reply to my question. Uh, is there any chance to to have similar, uh, I don't know, initiative in the future, or if, if you see there is there a future for such initiatives, for such ideas with new government? And what do you think about the idea for textbook uh, on Holocaust? Because it also appeared uh, at uh, CBH, so Central Bureau Historyczne in, in Berlin, and is it actually useful to build a dual or like combined narration about Holocaust and use both uh, voices in, in the textbook addressed for school kids? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I don't see any other hands, so I think Brendan, you're 
Thank you. I apologize for having a second bite of the cherry, but I can't resist asking our two Polish friends uh, this question, which is, um, if Germany and Poland could agree on a sum for reparations, would uh, Poland be content for that sum to be uh, spent by sending Taurus missiles uh, to support Ukraine? After that provocation, uh, <laughs> we can, uh, thank you, Brendan. Uh, we can, uh, I think, turn to our uh, speakers for some last thoughts and some answers to, the, to some, some very good questions in that uh, last round, if you can fit them in into your comments. Perhaps just to mix things up, why don't we change the order a bit? And, and Claudia, do you want to uh, start? Uh, okay, uh, yeah, maybe I can just start with the textbook question. Uh, because I very well uh, remember when uh, the German-Polish uh, textbook was represented uh, in Frankfurt Oda, actually at uh, the school my daughter went. Uh, so uh, it, it was a huge uh, celebration and, um, and it, it never, it was never, it, I guess it has never been used in schools. So it's a rather disappointing story. <laughs> so it was a project that uh, it cost millions and millions, and uh, so much power, so much um, yeah engagement, and yeah, and it's never been used. So yeah, it's rather it's really disappointing, and uh, so therefore. Um, I'm not sure if we try, if we should try again, so with, with other kinds of textbooks. Uh, so yeah, and maybe you could repeat your question short to the balance of. Sure. So basically, um, you you mentioned this idea of the Northern Roman Triangle, yes. and alliances versus friendship. And you know, there is some talk about you know Poland, you know, becoming a new engine for European integration. Ah, integration. Also, the frontier German engine. And to what extent that could, you know, change the balance between friendship and alliance in the new relationship? Ah, uh, you mean uh, how it will change the balance between friendship and alliance? Yeah, potentially. Yeah. Oh, maybe I'm the wrong person. I don't believe in friendship and geopolitics, so <laughs> uh, therefore I don't uh, think that. Uh, I I think it's more, for me at least, it's more interesting to look at how, uh, with Poland now and this very peculiar uh, geopolitical situation, um, um, Poland will change the balance of power in Western Europe, for instance. So, uh, according, uh, for instance, uh, in, 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 fr in France, uh, or, the, or the german france relation relationship, but not so much about friendship now. No. Uh, and, um, the reparation issue at the same, yeah. Um, I think it's very much uh, into the center uh, because of what uh, Brandon said. Uh, so what can you pay with the money you get from the Germans? Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that at the moment, uh, Germany has almost no chance not to pay. We have to pay. We, we will not call it reparations, no, by no means. And we will, we will also build this uh, Polish, German-Polish house in, in Berlin. I never, I, I, I was in the commission, in the foreign ministry commission on this, uh, on this house, this German-Polish house. And when I worked in this commission, honestly, I, I was so convinced that this will never be built. I thought, no, we, we won't have the money. Uh, this is just, it's a nice commission. I love to be there and to discuss this, but uh, I was very doubtful if this would ever go uh, into practice. Uh, now I think it will. And yes. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. It, can I turn to Pavel now? Yes, thank you. So uh, the question which was uh, repeated uh, several times, to what extent the reparations uh, are important for the new Polish government? I don't really think that they are of any crucial importance. I see them mostly as the legacy of the law and justice government, uh, and the new government has to deal with this legacy 
in a way which will be politically expedient, which will not cause too many troubles for them, which would not show them vulnerable. Uh, that's why I think that the new Polish government would be very uh, forthcoming as far as some gestures on the German side are concerned. One gesture we mentioned, this is the Polish German house, but this is mostly for the elites. Something more tangible uh, is needed, and in my opinion, this, that's why this rather, in my opinion, not very sensible idea of rebuilding the Palace Saski and, and the idea of having, having Germans committed into it as a sort of a substitute for the reparations. And you are right about the Taurus, uh, uh, that there is a growing uh, disappointment uh, in the Polish um, po public opinion regarding how uh, the Germans are still very defensive about helping Ukraine, and perhaps it's more harmful to the Polish-German relations than the issue of reparations. And by the way, I would like to make such a point that, yes, the new government has to deal with the reparations issue. To some extent, it creates, creates an impression that there is some continuity between the current government and the previous government, but there is a very fundamental difference that we didn't mention today. Uh, the difference is that uh, Donald Tusk and any other politician of the current ruling coalition, they don't use anti-German slogans at you know, every moment when they speak. And uh, it was something insane about the law and justice politicians, Kaczynski and others, that in almost every speech during the uh, parliamentary campaign, but also earlier and after the campaign, they attacked Germany and they attacked uh, Tusk as lackeys of Berlin. Uh, just the very moment when Tusk was accepted by the Polish parliament as the new prime minister, Kaczynski stood up and said, Donald Tusk is the German agent. You know, it's not rational. You cannot perceive it in any rational uh, term. So the absence of such a uh, aggressive anti-German rhetoric uh, on the part of the new government in Poland it's a fundamental difference, which we should not uh, forget. Uh, the question about uh, the um, uh, Polish-German textbook commissions. I think that it's a very important uh, body organization uh, with no very great practical influence upon schools uh, in Poland and in Germany. The problem is that uh, this uh, wonderful work they have done so preparing the Polish-German uh, textbooks uh, about history, and now the, the last volume was uh, finally published, they are only, and they will always be a something, and it will be only an additional material in schools, and it will depend on a teacher whether he or she will use it or not. And uh, I'm sure that it will be absolutely marginal in, in both countries. And I'm skeptical about such projects of writing together, uh, I don't know, a manual about the Holocaust. We have so many books. It's rather a question of how to use this knowledge, how to spread this knowledge, uh, than you know, having another initiative uh, of preparing something which will be always political because you know, such international bodies somehow stick to the you know, political logic and it's unavoidable and from scholarly uh, in scholarly terms, it's not extremely valuable. I prefer uh, to read a good book about the Holocaust by a German historian, deeply researched, or by a Polish historian. But of course, they can work together, but it will not produce any additional important outcome, in, in my opinion. Thank you very much, Pavel. Um, could I invite Karolina to uh, conclude uh, her contribution? Yes, first of all, thank you so much for the questions and also for the panel. I, I must admit it has been a feast. And the, the sentence, I have doubts whether translating history into current invoice is a good idea, I have noted for myself because this is so brilliant. Thank you so much. Um, now, I will try to, to, to answer uh, at least some of the questions. Uh, how to teach history? Um, I, 
I, I have two comments about that. Well, first of all, I do believe that uh, um, whether this is reconciliation of, uh, or alliance, uh, it is in any case neighborhood. And it's extremely important that we, uh, that we find ways to teach history so that both nations are aware of, of, of what has happened in the, in the past in the country of, of one's neighbor. Uh, and uh, I can say about consequences and, and results, it would be wonderful if, if um, it, it were more possible in the German schools to teach simple facts that the, uh, the attack on Poland in 1939 was not, uh, ha was not a coincidence, but was a part of ideological war against Polish state, society, and, uh, 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 and, and, and its symbols like Warsaw that has to be bombarded. So, so I'm, I'm talking about effects. And it's extremely important because in the end, we, we, we should see it like that. Uh, and, and what happened afterwards, like for example, for example, shifting the borders of Poland, taking Szczecin or, or Wrocław, well, this not, was not decision of Polish authorities. Mm -hmm. And I think this should be mentioned uh, because 1939 was obviously a, a decision of, of German authorities, uh, but, but, but the other wasn't. So, so it's, it's extremely important also for this discussion. Having said that, I would like also to say about education that we should be aware that not only school is teaching our children. Uh, we, we tend to forget that educators are actually in minority. Influencers, on the other hand, are in majority. So if, you, if we only think about schools and we don't think about YouTube and uh, uh, last but not least, TikTok. Uh, I think we, we will be, uh, I mean, th this will be not possible to, to, to tackle education as such. So I think we, we should probably think what education actually today means. Now, um, I was thinking about this conundrum between Warsaw and Berlin, present in both your questions, um, also with the Tauron. <laughs> A provocation, it was a nice one. Uh, I, I should, you should communicate it, I think, to the both uh, 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 governments. Uh, provided it's Cambridge, they will probably listen, at perhaps, least, perhaps at least are, to consider. We were overheard by the uh, Russian intelligence. And yeah, yeah. It will be all transmitted. Um, <laughs> so I was, I, was trying to, I was trying to write it in a very short aphorism, and here it comes. Warsaw must deliver. The issue of reparations must be somehow delivered because of the patriotic uh, uh, blackmail that you have been talking about. But also, also has to have Berlin as an ally in the war of Russia against Ukraine. This is the fundamental thing, right? And at the same time, Berlin must not uh, make impression that every country can now demand reparations because it's just undoable. And at the same time, it has a vital interest in, be, in being seen as a country without which it is impossible to, 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 to guarantee Ukrainian victory. So I think this is somewhere there. And I don't think that we can speak about reparations in an in a isola isolated way. We should really think about it in the whole uh, constellation that we, we have here. Last but not least, the, least, the Weimar, Weimar Triangle, I, I would say, um, those three countries uh, are doomed to compete with each other. They are big, they have great populations, uh, 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 large numbers, etc., uh, uh, etc. Et um, they have very strong cultures and now also very strong governments, uh, most of them. Um, so they are doomed to compete. But you can say the same about Poland and Ukraine. We are doomed to compete, we are too similar. But if you are doomed to compete, you might be you, you might create an alliance. Because then this, this wonderful uh, 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 quotation by Mont Montesquieu from the spirit of the laws uh, might work. Namely, this is a paraphrase, but he writes, it is good when people have the passions that tell them to do bad things, 
but at the same time, they have an interest not to do it. So I think this is about alliances. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so I now invite Florian to conclude our uh, discussion. <laughs> well, I mean, uh, that's, that's really a challenge because I have one minute, I guess, eh? and we have questions on the table, which is how to, how to, how to teach history, uh, how to repay historical guilt, how to secure peace in Europe. These are questions, sorry, I will, I, I, these are really great questions, and I really thank you uh, for, for posing these, these questions and also for, for, for um, discussing this here, but I, I won't be able to answer them completely at this point. Point. So, so what I would, would uh, do is, is uh, maybe to, to disagree with, uh, with my German colleague in a way. I don't think Germany will pay uh, reparations because of the domino effect which has, has, been, has, been, uh, uh, has been named. And I, I think this is out of the question. And uh, I, I think um, if, we, if we look at, at, uh, at, the, at the realities of, of how politics work, um, uh, we shouldn't, shouldn't uh, debate about that uh, so much more uh, longer. Um, I would maybe, maybe as, a, as, a, as a proposition, uh, maybe if it comes to the power Tsarsky, so the Saxonian palace, it would be a good idea to ask the government of Saxonia, whether they would be like interested in having a, yes. a supporting yeah, that, yeah, that, in a way. that is actually perceived as never being aggressive because we had common kings. But they yeah, will, well, they, they, they will be soon governed by actually. Thanks for thanks for adding thanks for adding that because <laughs> this is what I was getting at. Actually, this is the country, the, the land uh, in German, which is yeah, where the AfD, the right wing party, is the strongest center, which, which which is closest to Poland. I mean. A certain extent, but this is a different different discussion. So, so this maybe maybe as a remark on the side. What I want to say, as a um, um, by means of a conclusion, is that we should also take into account. We have not uh, talked about that so much as the differences in political culture between Poland and Germany. Um, I, I know this is a very inconcise um, terminus, and and uh, we can debate a long time about that. But I think it is um, uh, very interesting also in the in the current uh, situation. Um, uh, that um, uh, German, uh, Germany and, and German political culture is, is pretty much uh, characterized by a hesitancy towards great words and great phrasing and, and great uh, standing. Uh, and this is in a way epitomized, of course, by, by, by people like, like Merkel and also uh, our Chancellor Scholz nowadays. Um, they, they, are not, uh, they, they lack the ability, maybe even because of this uh, political culture, to make these great words and to, to, um, to announce like uh, Macron uh, did. Well, we don't exclude ground troops to, to send them to Ukraine. And, and, and also, um, I want to say, um, uh, parts of the, of the, of the negative uh, opinion Germany has in East Central Europe, uh, in, in Poland and other countries, is also a little bit a, a, a result from the German um, um, inability, maybe, um, but also um, hesitancy, I would say, uh, to great worth. And I think, actually, this hesitancy is a good thing. It is rooted in German history uh, because these great words had been, had been so, so fatal in, in, in 20th century history. So um, in the situation we are now, Germany is the second biggest uh, military supporter of Ukraine after the United States. Um, Macron is, well, has sent uh, scalps, uh, but, but is also not, not uh, uh, like, like, yeah, doing much uh, or enough uh, for, for solving the ammunition problem Ukraine has. Poland um, has enthusiastically um, supported um, European Union ambitions of Ukraine in the first place, but when it came to the point that Ukraine and agricultural goods should be should be imported to the Polish market. There were big problems also in Poland, so to speak. So I think, Poland, I think we should, Spain and I think we should, we it's should keep this, we it's should not keep only this in, in mind because Poland is, Spain and France are not the ones who, who like, like take the stance uh, that we are the ones who speak for Ukraine. And that's actually the difference between grand words and real policy, pragmat pragmat pragmatic policy, which is maybe more, more typical for, for German culture um, also today. And in this re regard, um, uh, I think we should also see this reparation question, which, which will not be solved on the, on, the, on the level of grand words, but on, on, on a pragmatic base. 
Thank you very much. I sense there will be a continuation of these conversations over dinner, and uh, I believe with uh, all present over wine, which there appears to be at the back of the room. But first of all, I want to thank um, Donatus uh, Kupchunas, Brendan Sims, and Charles Clark as the organizers of this event uh, through the Baltic Geopolitics Program of the Center for Geopolitics, and also uh, Elvira Tamus for her um, logistical uh, <laughs> assistance. Uh, so thank you very much for all of your work to organize this event. Um, I, I, would, I would like to thank all of you for coming along and participating so actively. And please join me in a very warm thanks uh, and ovation for our guest speakers this evening. <laughs>